It is my pleasure to introduce Alan Macy. I think most of you probably know Alan. I have known Alan for quite a while as the founder of SBCAS, the Santa Barbara Center for Art, Science and Technology. But although I thought I knew something, turns out I didn't. But I didn't know were all his other professional um, accomplishments, which I'm going to read to you. So Alan is the co-founder of IPAC Systems Incorporated, and currently he is their research and development director. And his talk tonight, I would assume, sources out of that um, professional engagement. He designs data collection and analysis systems that use those that are used by researchers in the life sciences, and they help identify meaningful interpretations from signals produced by life processes. As you can tell, I'm really looking forward to this because I don't really understand what this means. So I'm hoping to get a better understanding of what he's, what he's doing by what we're going to experience tonight. His recent research and artistic efforts explore ideas of human nervous system extension and the associated impacts upon perception. As an applied science artist, he specializes in the creation of cybernated art Interactive sculpture and environments. Tonight, we're going to learn more about embodied. What is the title of it? Not embodied. Something. Yeah. <laughs> Some kind of embodiment. <laughs> this, this is where this brochure comes in really handy. You can stick it up on the way out. You can see it's called embodied music. So that's what we're going to show. Thank you, Alan. registers in the brain. So the brain has the first sort of aha moment 
that something happened. And it wouldn't even be something you would normally be aware of. It's so quick. And then what happens is that any kind of sound moves through the brain for about a half a second, 500 milliseconds. It sort of bounces around in there and it, it routes through different pathways and uh, maybe it collides with an old memory and provokes something. And what, what happens at that, in this 500 milliseconds uh, of it bouncing around is that your body um, orients to the data. So let's take the case of, uh, let's say it's uh, 10,000 years ago and you're out on the plains somewhere and uh, uh, a saber-toothed tiger is charging towards you, growling, and, and there you hear the sound maybe, and you, you, you would want to maybe even react before you, uh, in the process of coming to judgment that it's a saber-toothed tiger, you'd want to react and maybe get out of the way. So there's an evolutionary advantage to orienting to the data. And so we're the same now, really. And so uh, uh, in this 500 milliseconds, you orient to the data. And what I mean by that is, is that you know, maybe, maybe your heart beats a little faster. Uh, you might start sweating in your skin. Uh, your respiration rate changes. There's stuff that sort of mobilizes. And, and maybe it's not necessarily a mobilization, maybe it's a relaxation too. It, it, it could be a lot of different things. It's just that you orient to the data. And then what happens is after this half a second of orienting to the data where you, it's coming into the brain and it's expressing the body and doing all this sort of foundational stuff to get you ready for like whatever it might be, might be is, uh, is then you, uh, at the tail end of that, you come to judgment about what happens. So, and about, so pretty much from the beginning of the sound when it arrives to your ears, or when you first see it, it's about 600 milliseconds roughly, uh, six tenths of a second, and that's about the earliest you can come to an opinion about something. And there's a, a test actually called the N600, which is a, a test that has to do with when you read a book and there's a grammatical error, and when you see the grammatical error, you recognize that it's an error. And so that researchers look at that and they think, oh, well, that's probably coming to judgment, like determining if something's a grammatical error. And so that's a real reliably evoked test. And then on the other side of that, like, well, how long might it take to come to judgment? Um, you could turn to Hollywood, and if you talk to a director, they'll, they'll say maybe something like, well, if you really want everybody to understand what happened, you don't cut the scene any shorter than three seconds. So probably somewhere between 500 milliseconds and three seconds, you pretty much come to judgment about like whatever it was. Meaning you have a concept or an understanding or something. And uh, so, and then maybe it takes longer, but for the most part, that's kind of what how it works. And uh, so in this 500 milliseconds, back to that, there, there's a, I mentioned before, your body orients to the data and it's a feeling. And, um, so this, this relates a little bit to this idea of emotion, and so uh, no one knows exactly what an emotion is. There's maybe six competing theories about what they are, and we all talk about them. But it's a little controversial exactly, you know, what what, the, what they are. And, um, and the, the first person I knew that talked about an emotion, or he wrote about it. His name was William James, and in 1890, he said, an emotion is, he said what happens is, is that we perceive something that changes in the environment, we have a feeling in the body, and our emotion is the label we give that feeling. So, yeah. and so he, anyway, that's one of six ideas about what an emotion is. Um, but, okay, anyway, back to feeling. So you have this feeling, and, and then you can think of the, the cognitive processes or the coming to judgment part, like this is part about having an opinion or a concept, uh, is that it's a, it's, it's bells on the feeling state. So here's an example. Let's say you're really upset and you write a letter to your boyfriend or girlfriend and the letter comes out a certain way because you wrote it and you're upset. 
And, and then if you like wait a day when you might be feeling a little different, then the letter comes out different. So it's like that. And so cognitive processes or higher level community judgment processes rest upon feeling. And then uh, there's a, uh, so they're related kind of. Thing. You don't know exactly what the coming jigger part is going to be. You just know that it's probably going to affect it. So, uh, so uh, there's this um, plot here. This, this was invented in the early 80s. And this uh, block up there. So there's two parts to this. This is called the circumflex model of affect. So this, 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 uh, this, this line here is called valence. And this slide here is called arousal. So, uh, and then these are some uh, feelings that are uh, expressed along this circle here around the circle. So, here we have kind of astonishing alarm, here we have fatigue and tired, pleasure over here, here comes this over here. So, uh, and you can plot uh, these feelings, and then these things are indexed by, it turns out, this is called circle total effect. It was invented by this guy named Russell and his team in the early 80s still used today and, and so anyway these things are physiologically indexed so there are um, responses in the body that allow us to perceive that the body perceived it as pleasant what happened and then there are responses in the body that thinking is perceived as unpleasant and then some things where it's more calm and some things where it's more aroused so it's called a physiological index and and so you, you people move through this two-dimensional affect space as a function of time. And, uh, or any kind of stimulus, including music. So uh, this is what we're going to be measuring today. We can, we'll do this uh, measurement here if, if we can get a couple volunteers or one volunteer. So see that muscle in uh, orange there above the eye? That's called the corrugator, that muscle. And so it's a little tiny muscle, like right here. And, uh, and that muscle, like if you're, uh, you know, it's like you're uh, displeased or upset about something, people furrow that, hold that muscle in when they're, when they're upset. And so it's, and it, if they relax it fully, it actually relax it fully if they're okay with things. So it, it's a sensitive to a measure of displeasure, that muscle, corrugator. And, you know, and it doesn't even have to be all that uh, profound, like, could you sometimes move that muscle in such a tiny amount that it wouldn't even be visible in my face, or you wouldn't even be aware of it? It's called a micro, uh, it's a, it would be a micro expression, where it just, it, it's so subtle that uh, uh, the only way to measure it is by measuring the electricity that is innervating it, and then you can kind of get a sense that it's been activated. So you can, you can look at it very, very subtle, you can see very subtle things. And uh, here's another one that uh, we're going to look at. So that muscle there in, in orange, this one here. Okay, so zygomaticus that causes smiling. Zygomaticus, this one. And corrugator, this one. This one. So these two, zygomaticus is a, is a pleasure sensor. So that when you're, uh, you're feeling good, you know, that can contract that one. And uh, once again, as we can measure that, through the skin by putting little electrodes right there above the corrugator to measure that. Psychomaticus, we can measure that one. And so we get really clear indications of like pleasure, displeasure for the person. Uh, and uh, once again, they're, they're quite subtle. And, uh, and then we're also going to take a look at this one. I think we see it super well, but this uh, here, the heart here. Over here is another view. What we're going to do is we're going to put, um, you know, like if, uh, uh, to measure this one, you can put a signal right here on your shoulder, another electrode right here, and you can gather that data from the heart, the, the data that's associated with the contraction of the heart, uh, you know, as it beats. So it's called the electrocardiogram, and it's a holistic variable. It tells you a lot about what's going on with someone, it tells you a little bit about their. Depending on how you look at the data, a little bit about emotional state, a little bit about uh, arousal. That's that one. And then um, that's the last one. So 
That's uh, there's a little gland on seafood. You, can you see it there? It says sweat gland right here. This uh, right next to the bacini and corpuscles. This little guy right here, sweat gland. It's like a little, uh, it's like a little pink curly blue things. So those um, there's 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 tiny amounts of saline that uh, uh, it's good for body cooling and there are uh, also these these uh, these glands they affect what's called the uh, skin uh, there's a, a phenomenon electrodermal activity so what we're going to do is we would measure the activity of the sweat glands in a very super uh, delicate way so the amount of water that actually comes up is vanishingly small we can still detect it we detect very subtle things about and this one is just related to sympathetic arousal, so you're more uh, aroused or not. So like you, you have higher, remember before it was vertical arousal, so the, the EVA electrodermalectality tells you about like that, and then the valence, that one that goes from left to right, that would be the microfacial expressions, and then the EKG from the heart kind of tells us a little bit about both of those things. All right, okay, oh, let's see what's next here, okay. So this is this is a little like diagram I drew today. So there you are in the center, and so there's art that happens, and so that would be at the top. And what what happens is you perceive the art through the senses. So your eyes, your ears, you smell it or taste it or whatever it is. Okay, you perceive the the phenomena of the art, and and then there's a reaction to it, and then there's a feeling that gets generated in the body. And, and then that feeling acts to help generate the concept, which then allows you to establish a relationship to the art, is what is kind of how it works. And, and at least it's sort of a simplistic way. And the part that we're looking at today here has to do with the feeling. And so we're, it's a kind of deep dive into the feeling is, is what this measurement is about when we talk about psychomatic and corrugator and we talk about electrodermal activity in the heart. It's all about the feeling. And in, in particular, there's this term called affect, which is where the feeling expresses as a physiologic change in the body that's measurable. So the term affect is sort of the, means the physiological expression of the feeling. And it's, a, it's an objective measure. You can uh, measure uh, measure all kinds of people, all kinds of circumstances, affect. Uh, any questions about any of that at all? I have one. Yeah. Uh, it's somewhat peripheral to art, but <clears throat> where in this circle does the fight or flight response develop? Oh, I think that would be like, like uh, so um, let, let's pretend the thing that is called art up there would be the thing that you're like frightened of. Okay, let's pretend that that's the case. So it's not art anymore. Maybe it's art. It's suitable for art. So it's anyway. You're, you're terrified of whatever it is you just experienced. Yes. And so you would you wouldn't you're not you don't know that until you've been perceived it through the senses that you're in fact terrified of it. You'd have to perceive it first through the senses. Like you have to get the data for you to know to know you'd be terrified of it. And so there's a so what happens is that you have this that link between perception and feeling, like. Right in there, that's where uh, fight or flight would be developed, is right in that quadrant, the perception and feeling quadrant. And then your, uh, your, your action that you would take in order to determine like, what you're going to do would probably be somewhere between feeling and concept. That's the action that you would take. And then at some point, when it says relationship, uh, or the way that you would think about just what happened to you and how you would sort of log it would be somewhere between concept and back to the thing that frightened you would be up there. That, at least that's how I would perceive it. So, yeah, the, these measures are these similar to the way a lie detector would work? Or uh, there, there's um, there's one measure here that's used in a uh, in a, a lie detector. But in, a lie detector is, is, is not a, it's a, the problem with the lie detector is that it's really not a scientific instrument. It's, it's, a, it's an intimidation tool. 
So it's not, it's not, it's not permitted in court. Uh, there's no, it has no legal validity. It's super easy to gain. Um, yeah, it's just not, uh, it's, it's not a meaningful, I, it's just an intimidation tool. So, uh, so um, but, just, but just backing up here a little bit. So what this equipment does is it just, it, it, all it's doing is measuring like the way that you are. So it's not injecting anything, it's not <laughs> stimulating. Now, all it's doing is just looking. And it, it's, a, it's a kind of, if you, if you knew somebody who was like really good, like fortune teller, and they're, they're really good at, they're empathic individuals, they can look at your body posture, they can see that you're sitting a certain way, or holding your neck a certain way, and then they can hear the way that you're speaking, that they're really good at, at assessing emotional, motivational state. Good fortune teller is really good at that. And this equipment's kind of like that. Like it's a, like a good for like it, it, it behaves that way. It, it, it's a it's a kind of in depth look at what's going on with someone physiologically to kind of get a sense of where they're at. And you can think of it as a kind of telescope. Like and so, uh, it would be the difference maybe between having uh, a telescope when the hair, air is a little hazy, and or maybe when the air is like really clear. And so depending on what you're looking at and the kind of Technology, it can be sort of one or the other, and this just happens to be one that's pretty clear. So, uh, uh, any other questions? Uh, so, what the, what the thought was, just a, if, uh, in a, it's a completely voluntary, of course, uh, what they call consensual uh, situation. So, uh, it would be um, uh, we have some physiological reporting equipment here that's manufactured by this company I work at called Biopack Systems. And this equipment is used by physiological, psychophysiological researchers all over the world. It's been around, been around for a long time, Biopack, since 1984. And uh, so uh, this is set up here, this equipment is set up to measure uh, the EMG, what I call electromyogram, from the corrugator, zygomaticus, uh, the heart, put electric here and here, and then also from the fingertips, the acronym. So uh, what, what we could do, if, if, if you all were into it, is we could, uh, is we, so could we want a couple of volunteers, to like put them on the, the chairs here, and then we could make measurements, and then we could play a little music, and then just sort of see what happens. And then we are going to display the data up on the screen, and then we could chat about it, like what the meaning of it all was, sort of. Uh, so um, how does that sound? Okay, so I, we're at, I guess we're at the volunteer stage. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, okay, well, I was, you know, I didn't look over here first, I'm sorry. So, uh, but, uh, uh, Elaine? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry, your name? John. John. And so, hey, you guys both raised your hand at the same time. So. Oh, no, uh, go ahead. Okay, so please, have a seat. So we face the... Oh, you know, I think whatever direction you'd like to face. So, I want to think I'll turn this off now. Oh wait, actually, I know I do need this. So, but we don't want to be. Uh, I tell you what. Let's, uh, how actually? How about right here? We'll put we'll, we'll you back here because then we'll be out of the, the way of the projector.
so we've got um, these are some of my favorite electrodes. They're fabric, um, residue. Yeah, they're really great. Excellent first rate electrodes. Yeah, almost all of them, maybe 95%. They're the ones that are not um, academic, they're like, uh, like they work at pacemaker companies or, or something like that. Is there a different reading between listening to the music and then watching the musicians or video where you get mixed uh, messages or images and sound? Oh, you mean if, when you mean listening to it versus uh, watching it and listening to it? Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, everything, you know, it all makes a difference. Uh, the, um, the most profound responses come um, through this uh, phenomenon called sensory integration, which is where um, it means that all the senses um, uh, are engaged. And, you know, those are actually the situations on the flip side, uh, like um, you know, World War One, World War One, they call it shell shock. But uh, when you have a super dramatic thing that happens to you that impacts all your senses in a very intense way, that can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. Is that the information is so profound and there's so much of it that, um, and the body orients to it all in a certain way, and then registers. that feeling, um, you know, as a memory, and then it becomes a kind of knot. So it, it, in, in the course of our regular day, we were making these things and sort of making them all the time. And the more um, intense it is, the more sensitive it is, the, the more it'll uh, stick. There is this thought, though, when it comes to something like, uh, like a post-traumatic stress disorder, that if it was made in you know, the sensory integrative capacity, like the sensory integration is required to make it, can be unmade. Mm -hmm. And then there are people working on that problem. Um, let's see. Okay. So next thing. Uh, you want to put the ones in? Yeah. That's next. Okay. So I think we're good. So we've got corrugator and zygomaticus here. Okay. And so these are EKG electrodes. They have a little different demand of the signals. The electrodes is going. So part here, we're going to measure. So up here on this side, yeah. Okay. 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 Perfect. Get one here. Uh, yeah, what it is a, what ground means is a. Is it like electrical ground? It, it, it's a it's it's a electrical terminology. Okay, here's some. Uh, um, and then uh, um, so like in this room right now, the one that we're in, so it's filled with electricity. It's got all these like on the floor here where we're plugged in, on the walls, all these things, all the lights, all the stuff. So there's like electricity all over the place. There's like many rooms around the world like they're like this. And uh, what happens is is that this uh, this electricity it, 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 it's actually 
actually flows through the air. Like it, you think it's up there, but it's not. It's mostly up there, but what it does is it, is it because it's copper and because it's metal, and because our bodies are, are like full of seawater, or we're salty, uh, we, um, we're, we, we're kind of like, a, a, we're, we're, we're sort of a, a repository for the displacement current that gets generated by through the wall and up there. And so this, 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 this information, this, this signal, which is 60 cycles at 120 volts, it, it, you can think of it as sort of a plate of what's called a capacitor. It just happens to be far away from us. And then there's like, what is it, five meters between here and the wall? Or really close to that one. So it's probably mostly from that one and these cables. And then uh, the, the, that, that information creates a field. And that field is, is present on that thing, also on my body. So if I took an oscilloscope probe to look at my body and just put it on my body, I would see a signal. And that signal is going to be probably in a room like this where I'm standing. It's probably going to be about a volt, one volt. So about a hundredth of what it is coming out of the wall. And it's very, you know, it's, it's not high current, but it's absolutely there. And then, uh, and so the, the, the signals that we're looking at, you know, this corrugator and the cyclonics and all these uh, signal signals, they're like about 10,000 times smaller than a volt. They're really small, so they're like less than a millivolt. They're like 100 microvolts or 10 microvolts. And so uh, that's really a super big obstacle when recording this data, because you're, you're, it's like you're, uh, like you're on a rowboat, some kind of boat in the ocean, and you have these hundred foot waves that your boat's going up and down in, and you're trying to measure a signal, a little like movement of the water that's this much, and you're like bouncing up and down in this like big wave. And so uh, there are special um, electrical, like electrical theories that can be applied that, um, that allow you to make that measurement in sort of a really precise way. And, uh, and so the, when I mentioned the phenomenon of ground, what it is, it's a ground in, in the case of these measurements, has to do with a kind of sample that the person on the rowboat is making that lets them be aware of the 100 foot wave and subtract it. So they don't have to worry about that. Exactly, yeah, it's totally like that, exactly. It's a kind of sound case. Remove the background noise, or, or sometimes, with, yeah, that's right. Like these headphones that when you're on an airplane and they remove the drone in the back, those work that way too. They're, they remove the, what's called the common mode. Okay, so uh, this is uh, pretty good. I'm making good headway here. So uh, let's see. So, um, let's start here with this one. We got all the. This work is, um, you know, around here in Santa Barbara. It, 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 you know, it seems like it might be kind of weird, this work. But it, it's actually uh, at the university, the psychology department. They do um, a lot of this work. This exactly like this. It's just like this. So in the, the psychology department, actually, UCSB, it used to be a psychology a bachelor's of arts. And now it's become a bachelor's of science. One of the things that
Oh, biohack. Yeah, so bi biohack, uh, yeah, it, it, it makes this hardware, but also makes what we're seeing on the screen here. Who is this, this software? I would say, actually, biohack is more of a software company than it is a hardware company. You know, we can make hardware. Um, the, it turns out that this uh, data, this physiologic data, is like, you know, it's, people are so complicated. Physiological data is no exception to that, super complicated data. And, um, and one of the things about this data is, is that it's very rhythmical. So in the same way that the, the uh, Earth goes around the sun and the, the days get longer or shorter, light comes up, all these things, all these rhythms that happen naturally, the, uh, the body rhythms are kind of the same. I mean, not necessarily the same frequency, but they're, they're periodic in the same way. It's all cyclic. The data is all cyclic. And, uh, and so the, the tools, the software tools that are used to be able to parse the data to try to figure out what's going on with it, um, those tools are all designed to work with data that is what's called periodic data. Has a tendency to repeat itself in one form or another. <clears throat> so the things that are really useful for researchers are like, well, how did the how did the how did the data did the signal go a little faster or did it go a little slower? Researchers are really interested in that information. That's certainly true of the heart. They want to know, well, is it eating faster or is it eating slower? Are you breathing faster or are you breathing slower? Those things are all important. And the brain waves, too, are no exception. I want to know about those. An example there would be when you go to sleep. The brain waves are really fast first, They're about 20 times a second. They move about 20 times a second. And then, what they, and then it, during the course of the evening, as you uh, get sleepier and sleepier, your brain waves start slowing down. So they start at 20 hertz, then they go to about 15, and they go to 12, and get 12, 10, and then you start dreaming. It's called REM, REM, so they drop it out of the sleep. And so, um, yeah. so yeah. Uh, so that's REM, the rapid eye movement sleep. And then when they go slower than REM, like eight or seven or eight, that's called stage three. And that's a kind of pretty deep sleep. And then and then at, uh, when they get down to like, like two, or uh, like right in there, those are the lowest waves, which are called delta waves. And that's super deep sleep. That's, and what actually happens there is your brain shrinks. It, it's really, it's, it can't support the higher waves anymore because it's sort of shrunk. The brain's gotten smaller. And it's gotten smaller because what it's doing is it's, it's kind of breathing. The brain's getting smaller because uh, it, it's created, it's been thinking all day long. And when it's been thinking all day long, it generates uh, these like metabolites, like residue from the act of thinking. You know, the, the, the kind of, like a, a kind of debris from thinking. Because it's a chemical process, and so when you uh, when you um, um, okay. Okay. so it's this um, this chemical process and. Then in stage four, what happens is this glial cell operation happens. It's the sort of network that supports the neurons. They, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, they support this kind of idea of the meta, like it's a kind of like a cleaning, basically. Like the brain is sort of clean at that point. And, uh, and then all this metabolic debris gets swept away, and then, uh, and then you wake up. Yeah, uh, so really good to get a good night's sleep. Pretty important thing. Okay, all right. Uh, so you have to get in the baseline first. 
Oh, yeah, I mean, um, sure. It's, uh, uh, there, there is this, uh, you know, you can be sort of, uh, you know, today I was going to sort of just like roll with the, you know, experience a little bit and just like show the data and then maybe, you know, kind of see some things. So like a real formal study, you'd have, a, you would do exactly what you said, you do a baseline and then you have try to control the circumstances, you present this stimulus and then you have like a post baseline and, and then you can sort of look at the profile of how things change. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if we'll do that here, but it's like sort of another layer. Uh, uh, probably like we want to separate you guys, like put you in some other spot and you know, all this sort of complicated stuff. So, um, okay, we just check everything here. Okay. Do they save together sometimes if they're in the same room? Pardon? Do people save together in their partners in the same room? Well, um, Probably they do. Uh, the uh, when it um, you know when, when it comes to when it comes to people, uh, it, we're we're I mentioned before like there's all these rhythms like the rhythm of the day and then the the, 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 the sunlight and then the change of seasons and when the moon comes up and all these things. So. Uh, um, and so we sort of, like the circadian rhythm is a really good example. So that's one where it's totally tied to sunlight. So when you wake up in the morning and are exposed, exposed to kind of this bluer light, um, what happens is, is the, uh, you'll get a burst of cortisol. And so it's a kind of, act, it sort of promotes activity. And, uh, but it's completely tied to sunlight at that time of the day. It's totally on a, like this 24 hour cycle. Circadian. I mean, that's what's called circadian rhythm, and then this cortisol, and then there's all bunch of stuff in the body that's like related to cortisol. That's just one example. There's just a whole bunch of stuff like that. And uh, so when when you say synchronize, what happens is we're already synchronous. So we're totally synchronized with stuff that's happening around us all the time. And and when like when they put these people in like these underground, um, like the experiments back in the 70s, they lock somebody in a small room and like remove all uh, like any kind of normal, like but they can turn the lights on and off when they want. They just went sort of nuts. Like they just, they, they didn't stay for 24 hours. They just sort of started drifting around right time and their circadian rhythms got all screwed up. And, and they just kind of went off the deep end, sort of. And uh, so, uh, so we're, we're pretty sensitive to these things that happen around us. And when, um, uh, and, and when those things go away, then you know, we, we kind of. And so it's, it's, a little, it's interesting when it comes to this thing like living in a city, and if you're not exposed to maybe natural phenomena so much, maybe the city lights keep you up or got noise, and so you're a little. There's this kind of. And most people in the world live in cities now, so 50, over 50%. So you kind of it's this like little disconnection from I mean, this, the relationships that we have to nature are starting to change. And so that's resulting in probably no surprise, but like certain kinds of problems, like kind of mental problems and things like that, you know, the physical problems, because of this, uh, in part probably because we're, I mean, this is my personal thought about it, that feels reasonable. Uh, um, so, uh, so where were we here? Okay, so we have here on the screen, uh, we, we have, uh, Electrocardiograph data, and, and uh, so uh, uh, yeah, this is a link over here, okay, over on the side, and John and John over here also, okay. So you've got Elaine's electrocardiogram uh, on the right, John's electrocardiogram on the left. There's uh, uh, EDA data here, which let me try to see if I can. And uh, you know sometimes the data can be a little more blocky or not. Does that, none of that matters. Okay. So um, one thing that uh, you could try here is um, John and Elaine just like smile, smile. Okay. Great. Okay. Relax. Okay. Okay. 
now, let's see here, display on the scale. Okay, so the smile came up. And notice what happened too with uh, actually Jung and Elaine, both of them. As soon as they did that, they had an increase in eccrine activity. So they, they started smiling just a tiny bit more when they smiled. And, and so remember, we were, we were talking a little bit about eye detectors previously. If you ever are in a situation where there's a lie detector, um, all you have to do is just smile. And really, uh, it's completely effective at uh, uh, completely allowing the lie detector. And lie detector has no place to stand. So it has, so if you smile randomly, it'll just completely uh, throw it off. Okay, so now here's the other, here, here, here's another one. Uh, and corrugator is a little bit different depending on the situation, but this is a frown, like I'm so upset about something like that. Okay, so notice that corrugator right here, okay? So let's see, just play on this, you know. Which color? That's represents? the third one. Purple. Yeah. Purple. Yeah. Um, make sure I got that. Okay. Yeah, so that was uh, the, the corrugator. So go ahead and do the frown again. Frown. Okay, so the third one is corrugator. Now smile is uh, the fourth one. Okay, so everybody got that? So heart rate. Electrodermal activity. Um, yeah. What happens if someone smiles and frowns at the same time? Does that work? Uh, it's totally possible. <laughs> yeah, you can see that for sure. just as well because we're doing our study. Okay.
That's the heart, yeah. So why did he go with that kind of way? Um, why does it look like that? Okay, what I'm going to do is take a closer look here. Gonna look at all the data here. Okay, so here we have two plots, and uh, so there's the heart at the top, which we can get into a little bit later. Um, but just to show you, it's actually this is, so. This is about oh, about three, a little over three minutes of data, and so it's a lot of heartbeats. So if I take one, like take this little magnifying glass like this, and I look at just. It, and the heart looks like that. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it just happens to be compressed. So, a lot of it. Okay. So, we got some heart, heart rate data there. We've got um, equine activity for John. And something happened. John, right, like, pretty much like two thirds of the way through the thing. There's something, you know, it's like affected of John here. Like, so it's like something in the music, maybe a reminder or something. Now, and, uh, and then Elaine did too. It had a, there was a steady increase um, in EVA response, and then kind of a drop. So uh, uh, there was like a little bit of like a arousal curve because you can see the differences between the arousal curves there. And the third one, that's very interesting. That when you see corrugator that does this, it's, it's a, it can be also an indication of sort of an increasing concentration. So like paying increasing amounts of attention to. That is very typical, actually, to get that kind of response where there's a steady rise like that. If there's bursts of corrugator, it might be more of a displeasure, but in this case, it means that it's, it's more of a, like, because it's a steady rise. And then down here at the bottom, um, these sections here, uh, these are zygomaticus, and so these are points that, that um, Elaine, right here, 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 and John, here, 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 that were, uh, you reminded them were a pleasure point. Uh, maybe it could be a little funny, even possibly. So, yeah. So uh, anyway, that's just a little bit, a little bit of a cursory view of what psychophysiologists do, how they look at the data, how they interpret it. And, um, I wanted to ask you something. When uh, I finished my art degree, uh -huh. I did some study with Annette Goodhart. Had you heard of her? Mm -hmm. She was at UCSB doing her PhD in laughter and learning. Oh, okay. Uh, she was around now, I'm sure. I know yeah, the, the so of it before my time. one of the things that she talked about was the different masses. This was back in the 70s. Okay. The different uh, number of muscles and nerve endings around smiling as opposed to frowning. Oh, yeah. The, uh, and that, that smiling muscles and nerves activate different places in the brain, which her ideas were and what was going on at the time was that the more you smile and laugh, the happier you actually get, or you feel like that. Yeah, it, it, it's completely true. If you, if you, there's this, so, um, if you adopt the expression, this is how you become, it's like that. Uh, it's it's uh, you you can lead yourself around a little bit. You can make the decision to smile. That has absolutely will have the change in, in, uh, in ph the physiological change in the body that registers. It's like that with with many things in the body. You can kind of uh, give it directions in a way. How many people have healing sculptures like carols and things? We make healing sculptures. Can you can you can you read? The energy coming from healing sculpture. Uh, you know, the, so the, the, the equipment. It, it, so this, uh, the way this equipment works is, 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 it, is it, it considers. Um, it basically looks at voltage. So it's, it's uh, just the, the 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 manifestation of the movement of current, mm -hmm. and and so when the current, an electron encounters a resistance, it makes a voltage, and whenever our all the things, many, many th aspects of our body, called electrophysiology, it's cellular action potential, so it's a movement of, it's like calcium ions, potassium ions, and when a neuron fires, and it, 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 those, that, there's a chemistry there, and it's basically about 110 millivolts, and the only reason it's so small that we look at it is because that's get all the way to the surface for us to look at it, but this equipment is basically designed to measure voltage, and so 
the voltage is not the human body, so it, 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 it's calibratable to like physical phenomena. Like you could, it's um, it, you could sort of put in an input and measure the output. And so it, whatever it would have to be measuring would have to generate a kind of some kind of physical signal. Like, uh, and so it, if it had a motion, a motion would be can be converted into a voltage or. If it had a, a change in opacity, that could be converted into a voltage. So like a, a lot of uh, semi-precious stones crushed up, would that create a voltage? Um, I'm going to take these off here. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, so there are these uh, materials in nature called piezoelectric materials. And so when you compress them, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they, they produce voltages. Ceramics do that, too. Um, so, uh, I'll just turn these off then. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I know it's not a real direct answer to your question. Yeah, I, I, you would have to, you would have to kind of, yeah. uh, the best way, I guess, of deciding is you put a probe on there and just see yeah. is there anything in there. Um, that would be the best way. Thank you. So, um, I was looking for a correlation between the electrical graphs and the structure music. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a couple of times, but rarely, there would be a spike in the graph associated with a louder note. It seemed like the volume had more to do with it than any other structural component. Yeah, volume would be important. But for the most part, there didn't seem to, they seemed to be pretty independent. Um, I couldn't see uh, any really of course, I, I don't know what kind of analysis <laughs> you could do, but there didn't seem to be, like, as, as the structure of the music evolved in a certain way, yeah. it did not seem that the electrical response followed that particularly. Mm -hmm. Is, do, do you have any comments on what kind of relationship you would expect there? Good. <laughs> yeah, someone else would probably, you can keep them there for a minute. <laughs> uh, so, um, it, remember, uh, like, like, imagine somebody sitting in an audience and they're just listening to the music and you're just observing them. And, and so they might be doing certain things like combing their hair or they might be on their iPhone or uh, blinking or any of these things. And so uh, it, 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 and to try to discern what someone might be thinking or where they're at just by looking at them when they're listening to music could prove to be difficult. And so the measurements that we're doing here are really not any different than that. They're, they're a deeper dive into, into these like very subtle things about people that tell you about like that affective state. But, but, but they're, they're also subject to, like affective states also subject to like what's your previous memory? And what, like being in here inside of this place, it might remind you of something. And so that has a kind of quality and then you overlay that quality with the uh, music, and then you get another thing. And so it, uh, the, that, that question is super important and super complicated question. And so when researchers do this work, they, they try really hard to eliminate all variables, and then they try to look at a lot of subjects in order to assess what happens. And do, do, do these um, signals correlate with any particular place in that circle of response? Yes, yeah, they, they do. They, they correlate with the, the, the bottom of the graph where it said feeling. That's yes. totally where these are. Okay. These are all associated with the feeling state. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so I wear a pacemaker for uh, neurocardiogenic syncope. Oh. I wonder, is, is, is that interfering with the data that I'm collecting? The, the pacemaker? Yeah. It would, it would show up on that. How yeah. Would, how, would it, how would it read up there? It would read kind of like that, but it, it would look probably a little different. Like, and it would be, it would, it would have a kind of regularity that um, that well, wouldn't be regular. wouldn't be present. I, I mean, I don't know about the, de the design of the pacemaker, but it, it, would, it would just be you know kind of like encouraging firing in a specific but, way. But but is the fact that I'm wearing that electricity? Oh, I don't think so. I, yeah. I, uh, um, well, let me put it this way. 
So they're, they're, when it comes to the heart, so there, there's like one channel from the brain to the heart that kind of tells it to do certain things, and there's nine back. From the heart to the brain? From the heart to the brain. But that's where I have the problem, because they miscommunicate. Well, um, so, it, but, but, the, but the heart, it, it just doesn't, like the pacemaker is just, all it's doing is it's kind of a spark. And then the heart is doing its thing. It's like it's contracting, it's moving the blood, it's, and the heart's fully innervated. So all the, the activity of the heart, the contraction methodology, how it, how it gets information back from the peripheral venous system, feeds the heart too in terms of how it does. So it's doing its thing. It's just kind of doing a little nudge. So I think it's fine. You know, yeah, I think you have to worry because it's not not just about like when it starts. It's kind of the whole process of the of the thing. So yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Why is it that you see that as children this quest? This. I mean that all of this. Well, uh, it, 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 it all started with, with um, getting married and then having a child and sort of thinking that, you know, like kind of needed to like find a way of all, all that. So it started there. Well, it started before that, actually. It started, I worked for an experimental psychologist at a, uh, at a, at a state hospital. Lately, I've been, I've been interested in the relationship between uh, uh, these, these kinds of signals and perception of art has been interesting uh, experiments. I, I think there's, it, it feels actually to me like, like if, you, if you look at the whole canon of art, you just take a case of paintings, and so here's, over here is re reality, and then over here is sort of like the person, our perception, and so that maybe some time ago, or it still happens, but, you know, art was a little bit more literal. You know, like it was more reflective of like how what people like, you know, they saw kind of like I saw that house or that bowl of fruit or or, or my imagination of Jesus Christ or whatever it is. And so the kind of this version of reality. And then like at some point you get to the impressionists and then you look at it and you go, I don't know quite know exactly what it is. And I mean I had this idea about it reminds me of maybe of this thing. Uh, and then, um, and then even like you take something like James Terrell, and the painting's gone away, and it's just the light actually. It just and so it seems like what happens is that more and more recently, conceptual art is just moving very, very close to the person, and so it's very personal. It's a dialogue. Between, it's like a poke. It's like a personal poke. Uh, conceptual art, and it, it just um, it's a, it's a resonance between the art and that person that's very unique to them. And it seems to me that the feeling information, this kind of information is very important, relevant in that discussion about like what is conceptual art and, and, what, and what is our relationship to it and, and the, the relationship of the art to the feeling, to the response. And it just seems like the art's moving closer and closer and closer to what it is to be human. That's how I see it. So, and so that's why I don't know if the, the work's intriguing for that reason. Um, I have another question. Unfortunately, the visual is gone at the moment. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, just by looking at those two different graphs, uh -huh. do you know, can we tell how they felt about the music? Well, I, uh, <laughs> um, I think that we could make it like if we if we expanded out the size of the study and we were a little bit better in terms of our controls, like the baselines, pre and post, and um, it, I think we could get a pretty good handle on sort of what the like we we could, we could categorize actually sort of like the level of sort of displeasure or, or, or concentration maybe versus the the um, the. Uh, indications like points of pleasure. We could we could determine things like like did the music uh, result in a situation where the individual started to become more sensory aware, so they would become they were more self-excited. 
so that you can start to see increased electrodermal activity as a consequence maybe of the, the piece in the music. And so you could, you could determine whether or not the music kind of sensitizes the person or desensitizes them. You could learn stuff like that. Uh, you could learn um, if the music was more arousing, looking at the change in heart rate. I mean, there, there was like just when it comes to this stuff too, like about five percent of it or less even, like just the collection is super basic actually, and about uh, almost all the effort goes into the analytics, like how how do you want to parse it and the data, and then the conclusions you make. So, yeah. Um, so film composers have to manipulate their audience with their music, and I wonder if you've ever worked with uh, composers who find new ways of. Um, uh, generating feelings. I mean, that all composers, uh, film composers especially, know that certain chords uh -huh. create different feelings, but maybe there are new sorts of music in the same way that Philip Glass did that repetitive uh, kind of uh, score for Koi Anastasi. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. was, uh, imitated. It's been imitated, you know, for 30 years. Yeah. But maybe there's something else that could come along. Uh, but have you worked with them? I have. I have. Oh, do you want to work with one who's 34? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, there, there is a, a, a lab in town that I've got involved with. It's called the Emotional Affect Media Center. And it's a, it's a neurophysiology lab. And it's, it's, uh, it's starting to engage with the university and other organizations to do uh, like deeper dives like this. And, um, so there was the study that ran under recently was with UCSB students that were interested in the nature of awe, like to be awestruck. Mm -hmm. and so how do you characterize that? What does that mean? How is that encouraged? Uh, how do you measure it? And, and the awe is a good one, because it seems like a lot of memories stick to that. Right. It's something, you know, uh, fundamental, yeah. important to know about. Right, right. Um, uh, yeah, it's super interesting uh, work. I, I, I think that there's uh, a lot of it a lot that people can learn. I was just in Toronto before being here, where this was brought up there, and I was working with um, there were two theater um, people, and they're experts in this technique called the Backdoor Method, which is a kind of acting method that's based on the idea of interoception, so how aware of your own body are you? And it, this lady, Erica Backdoor, she teaches this methodology whereby she trains the individual to sense like the nature of gravity and the nature of blood flow, and, all these different aspects of your body, and then when you know about them, and then you're attempting to act, you're like putting on a character, and if you can feel it, then your, your acting becomes much more, uh, this is much more believable, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that there, it, it, I, it, she, I, she's not exactly sure why, but probably related to the mirror neuron system, like with people, like when you perceive something, uh, a kind of integrity in someone in terms of their physical emotion, or, or the way they're behaving, we kind of have this sort of weird sense for it. And it's, it's, it's called, the phenomena in that world, that somatic world, is called kinesthetic transference. That's the phenomenon. So they label it and they notice it. And so the, it's, the study was on practitioners who either are loaded with the vector of technique or not loaded, and then we're looking at whether or not they were kinesthetically transferring as effectively. And that's kind of how they And that kind of stuff is. Do you have an arts practice? Pardon? Do you have a personal arts practice that play I, I, Yes, I do have a personal arts practice, yeah. Um, I, I, I have been working recently in this area of a, of a, a group, um, uh, like participatory, group participatory art, and, the, and like basically biometrics and group participatory art. The uh, project there is, is, a, is called the Biometric Campfire, which is where you have six people sitting around a pillar, and, and it's measuring all the heartbeats from everyone. And then the heartbeats are reflected in a kind of, um, uh, in the pillar, in a kind of light, uh, photonically, like a light. And then when the group, the group's heartbeats will either desynchronize or synchronize, and then that affects the, na the nature of the light that is expressed. So it's a kind of a group supra physiological organism, sort of like, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. Yeah.